Good morning and happy Easter to you and your family this morning. I know it's discouraging being in lockdown again and online for our Easter service and I just pray that you're okay through all of this. It makes celebrations like Easter so complicated and frustrating and I hear you and I'm with you. Not being able to spend time with family and friends is not good for our mental health and I'm seeing the impact of COVID on a lot of people. And I encourage you to call or reach out to me if you are in need in any way. Enjoy the service this morning. I'll be back at the end with a little message and a prayer to close. Enjoy the service. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent as he stood accused beaten mark and scorn bowing to his father's will he took a crown of thorns oh that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Son of heaven, God's own son, to purchase and redeem. And reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out. Hallelujah, praise and honor unto Thee. Thou, my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the sun sets free oh is free indeed now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my jesus spilled now the curse of sin has no hold on me who the sun sets free oh is free The stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Where your heart.
Hey, so good morning. Uh, yeah, today is Easter. Today is the day when Christians celebrate resurrection. Resurrection, such a such a strange and beautiful word. Um, but what does it mean? What does it actually mean? Is it just what happens when when a person rises from the dead? Or when the Bible writers used this weird word, did they mean something more than that? Um, you see, the Bible was was written by Jews, all right? And, and where most cultures in the ancient world had a pretty sophisticated theology of life after death, Jewish culture didn't. Uh, in fact, if you read through the, you know, the Hebrew Bible and you look for the bits that talk about what happens after you die, there's not a whole lot there, which is weird because the surrounding cultures in the ancient world were really into life after death. For example, the ancient Egyptians, they were, they had a, you know, a huge uh, a theology of what happens after death, the Book of the Dead, famously. Uh, so here's an afterlife scene from the Valley of the Kings. And um, what's going on here is a person has died and... Um, uh, uh, and after they die, they're judged. And in this judgment, the Egyptian god Anubis carves out the dead person's heart and he weighs it on a scale against a thing called the shoe feather. And if the person's heart was found to be lighter than the shoe feather, well, he, he you know, he went into Egyptian heaven, whatever that looked like. Um, and if the person's heart was found to be heavier or loaded with sins, um, then he was devoured by the demon god Amut, who is, uh, who I think was a crocodile or something like that. And as ideas of life after death go in the ancient world, that's fairly typical. Uh, the Greeks believed that once a person died, their body was ferried over the river Styx by the ferryman, famously. And if they were found to have lived a bad life, they ended up in a place called Tartarus, where they received cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, uh, so, for example, in this painting by John Waterhouse, um, uh, there's a group of women. They've been sent to, to the Greek version of hell, Tartarus, and their cruel and unusual punishment is that they have to spend eternity trying to fill a perforated basin with water. Um, pretty weird, but there you are. Um, uh, the Romans had similar ideas. In Roman thinking, if a person was judged to have lived a good life, uh, they went to the Elysian fields. This is a concept they borrowed from the Greeks, of course. Um, um, yeah, so, um, and if a person in Roman thought was judged to have lived neither a, a good nor a bad life, they were sent to, to, to Hades, a very drab, dull, passionless sort of eternal existence. And as ancient thoughts go about life after death, all those are fairly typical. All right. So so every culture that surrounds Israel, every culture that surrounds the place where the Bible came from, had had deep, deep ideas, specific ideas, colourful ideas about what happened to us when we die. But the Jews had almost none of that. Um, as I said to you a second ago, if you study what the Hebrew Bible says about life after death, it won't take you long. There's almost nothing there. They just weren't interested in it. But what did animate these ancient Hebrews, what did fascinate them, was was that as they looked at the world around about them, and as they looked at their own personal lives, they, they had this sense that things were broken. But, but you know what I mean? That somehow things were not quite right with life. And so one of the key ideas in the Hebrew Bible is the idea of God fixing, repairing and restoring the areas of life that are damaged, worn out, and broken. And that restoration, that fixing, that repairing, eventually became known as resurrection. And so immediately, I think, 
we as 21st century Christians can see our place in the biblical concept of resurrection. Because, you know, regardless of the very convincing con job we all do of pretending that everything is perfect in our suburban lives, you know, deep down, we all know that 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 in so many ways our lives are a broken version of what they were supposed to be. Um, we all know that we've settled for less than we should have, and 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 when we face up to the brokenness, when we accept that 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 things aren't right, when we're honest about what's damaged in our own story, it's only then that we can begin to grasp what the Bible means when it talks about resurrection, new starts, new beginnings, all right? Now, the um, the Hebrew poets who first coined this, this concept expressed the idea by talking about bones, um, and the reason for this is pretty obvious. Um, ancient Israel was an agrarian society on the edge of a desert. So uh, the geography of Israel, the Levantine Crescent area, you know, there's pockets of it around the River Jordan that are pretty fertile, pretty awesome for growing stuff. But, you know, you just step a few miles beyond that and you are into desert. So when these weird Hebrew poets would would go from the fertile strip of land on either side of the Jordan River and wander into the desert, they would come across scenes like this. And and in their agrarian society, this scene is just simply wrong. Okay, this this animal shouldn't be dead. Uh, its bones should not be lying bleached in the heat of the of of the of the sun. Uh, this animal should be back grazing on green lush pasture by the banks of the River Jordan. That's what's meant to be happening, but what actually ended up happening was this animal wandered off into the desert, got thirsty and died, and here are its bones. And and this to them became a symbol of what our life is like. All right, It wasn't meant to be like this. It wasn't meant to be damaged. It wasn't meant to be broken. It was meant to be prosperous and and you know flourishing and doing well. And, and and into this wrongness, the Hebrew poets spoke of a time um, when God would fix everything, when God would repair everything and make things new again. The most famous example of this, of course, is Ezekiel's famous vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, in, in surreal language, God says to his broken people, I make breath to enter you and, and you will come to life. Look at how many times the word life is mentioned in this. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin and you will come to life. And so in Hebrew antiquity, about, I don't know, 500 BC or something like that, with these words, was born the Christian concept of resurrection, a concept of of broken men and women being unbroken and living restored new fresh lives in an unbroken world. And and, and the rising from the dead bit that we associate with Easter was was that first century Jews believed that that those who lived with the constant hope of this new world, those who who went through the struggles of life, believing that one day God would repair everything and give everything a new beginning, but who died before they ever got to see it, those people first century Jews believed would would um, would be resurrected from the dead and 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 get to play a role in the life to come. So it's very important when we're reading the Bible to think what did the original audience of, of the Christian story 
understand when they first heard these key words, all right? So if you're living in the first century and you're Jew and you hear the word resurrection, you immediately think of two things, okay? The first thing you think about is this new era in the future where, where men and women are repaired and restored and the brokenness is, is fixed and the damage is healed, all right? And the second thing you would think about is, is, is the rising of, from the dead of, of everyone who hoped for that but who died before they ever got to see it. All right. So, so now that you understand that, let's let's dive into the Easter story in the Bible. So, at the end of Mark's gospel, um, we're told that Jesus is is dead. He's on the cross, and we're told, interestingly, that several women were watching from a distance. Now, the word watching is is a loaded term in Mark's gospel. Um, what Mark means when he uses this word is, is a person is seeing something, but their seeing does not lead to understanding. Right? So just, and you understand that. You've, you've seen loads of people like this in your own life. Just because a person sees something, it doesn't necessarily follow that they understand what it is they're seeing. That's what Mark is telling us about these particular women. They're seeing Jesus die, but they don't understand what they're seeing. Nevertheless, faithfully, loyally, they're there. Then more details. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the younger, uh, James the younger and of, uh, of uh, Hoses. Never know how to pronounce that word. And Salome. Um, then some more detail. In Galilee, oh, this is so interesting. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. So clearly and unusually for the ancient world, the, the early Christian movement was heavily populated by women. I mean... And it's interesting that the early Christians included this detail in the story, because here you have the end of Jesus's life, and the men are nowhere to be seen. And yet the women are there to the end. They're not giving up. They're loyal. They're, they're you, know, you know, they were with Jesus at the beginning, and they're going to stay with him to the very, very end. And, and it's interesting, I think, that the early Christians we're careful to include this little detail in the gospel story. So clearly, and there's no argument about this, um, clearly women were not a, at the periphery of early Christianity. Um, here in this verse, the key Christian word followed is used. Uh, they were followers of men, you know, followers of Jesus, just like the men were. However, unlike the men, who at this point in the story have all ran away, they are there to the bitter end. And I wanted to say that because, you know, you hear a lot, an awful lot of nonsense in, you know, in our, you know, in, in our woke 21st century culture that, that somehow Christianity is misogynistic and that somehow Christianity is an example of a patriarchal society that is oppressive to women and all that. And I'm sorry, but that is just absolute nonsense. It, it, it you know, the facts are are the complete opposite of that. Here you have what uh, probably the earliest Christian docu uh, document, actually, certainly the first of the Gospels to be written. Uh, yes, it was written by men. Yes, it was written in a male-dominated culture. All the more remarkable then that it's careful to include this detail. Women were important. Women were actually more loyal than the men were. Okay, so so don't listen to anyone who says Christianity is patriarchal, misogynistic. It's just nonsense. It's just absolutely not true. Um, anyway, uh, then into this very interesting story about a group of women following Jesus. Mark inserts another story about a rich fella who takes care of Jesus' funeral. OK, so we're told in verse 42, it was preparation day, the day before Sabbath. Um, 
uh, that's important because bodies can't be buried on the Sabbath. Um, and, and so as this day is approaching, uh, a man called Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, so he's on the who's who of Jewish society. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He would have been there um, uh, uh, a few uh, hours earlier at Jesus' trial. Um, he would have been there as the Sanhedrin were, were, were physically assaulting Jesus and verbally assaulting Jesus. However, clearly he was not part of any of that abuse because Mark tells us that he was one, he was one of the good guys, right? He was waiting for the kingdom of God. So here's a person who is perhaps a closet follower of Jesus. Um, he, he sees in, or I should say he saw in Jesus, a, a hope of resurrection. So he, he probably heard some of the stuff Jesus said. He probably saw some of the stuff Jesus did. And he thought to himself as a biblical scholar, well, he's the one, right? He's the one that, that, that God's going to use to repair everything and fix everything and make everything new and fresh again. And uh, sadly, uh, that's all gone now because Jesus is dead. And so the only, the only decent thing to do is, you know, is, is give this man a decent goodbye. That's... That's really all he can do now. Um, that's only right. So uh, we're told that Joseph uh, bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. So uh, just some basic uh, funeral details there, really. When a person died in ancient Palestine, um, uh, the, the body was washed. It was scented with spices it was then wrapped tightly in cloth uh, what happened after that was it was then laid on a on a stone shelf to uh to decompose then after that happened the bones were gathered up and placed in a in a bone box an ossuary um and yeah stored away with with the rest of the family and so all you read in this verse is just a collection of those details happened every day you know you know, people die every day, people get buried every day. It was just, this is a very ordinary verse. Uh, then we're told that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jose, saw where he was laid. Again, this word saw is the same word that Mark used at the beginning of this story. It means they saw, but they did not understand. Uh, so they were seeing Jesus being buried. That's what they're seeing. And they are attaching to that their traditional funeral understanding. This is just another sad day for a family in Israel. Okay, a man they love is dying. He died. He, his body was prepared. It was placed in a burial place. And I don't know what to tell you. That's, that's where their head is at right now. And so still operating in that mindset, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus's body. Um, little, you know, just so just some more funeral details here. Uh, the purpose of these spices are, um, not to put it too graphically, they're for smell reduction. Uh, bodies in Israel were not embalmed as they were in ancient Egypt. They were just made to smell nice. And... Um, of course, so what you're seeing here then, when women bring these spices to Jesus' grave, this is, this is an act of pure affection. That's all this is. Uh, this comes into the same category of caring for a loved one through a debilitating illness. So although these women don't understand what's going on, although they they don't, you know, they, they see stuff, but they don't get what they're seeing, they're nevertheless clearly committed to Jesus. They love this, or I should say they loved this man. This is very kind, very generous what they're doing. So after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, Jesus um, was was big for these women, right? Uh, 
uh, he, you know, he meant the world to them. And so I get, and I'm sure you get as well, how how sad they must have been walking to the cemetery that morning. Um, some of these women we know had lived very interesting lives. Uh, Jesus had accepted them. Jesus had given to them confidence. He gave them a place. He gave them a role, and you know the you, you know the they got their strength from Jesus. He was he was everything to them in these past years, and now he's now he's gone. And so for them, all today is is the first day that they have to figure out life without him. That's all they have. That's all today is. It's 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 the day after the funeral, right? You've you know, you've been there, many of you, most of you. Someone goes, they're not in the in the world anymore, and you you have to figure out how you go on without them. So this is just natural. They go to the cemetery to, I don't know, process stuff. I guess say goodbye. We all do it. When they get there, they see that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So, the word white in the Bible is a clue word for angel. So, these women enter the tomb, they immediately see this this figure, and they, it's it's... It's a scene that that isn't in their world view. Um, so th so they have this what is going on kind of moment, right? They just don't understand it. Um, and so Mark naturally says that they were alarmed. Uh, the word alarmed means a combination of amazed, shocked and scared. Um, it's the kind of vocabulary you would use if you saw a ghost. Okay, this is this is very uh, otherworldly language. In verse six, the angel addresses their fear and says, "Don't be alarmed." This, by the way, is uh, another example of um, what I think is the Bible's most commonly spoken command. Don't be alarmed. Don't be scared. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Right, the Bible says says that more than it says anything else. Don't be scared, okay? Don't be afraid. Uh, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. Okay, now again, the word looking. This is a negative word in Mark's gospel. It means I'm looking for something and I expect it to be where um i you know I, i'm looking for something and i expect it to be where i where i expect it to be all right so uh for example i'm looking for my golf clubs um i expect them to be in the cupboard under the stairs because that's where i left them so i expect that when i open the cupboard under the stairs my golf clubs will be there just where i left them and in the gospels this word is always associated with expectations. So, for example, Jesus, early in the story, is what? He's a Bible teacher. He's a teacher of the Torah. And so the Pharisees and his disciples and even his own family are looking for Jesus to behave in a way that matches their expectations of a first century Torah teacher. And most of the trouble that Jesus got into came from his not fitting into the expectations that other people had of him. Uh, that's how he behaved in life and in death. He behaves no differently. So they come to the grave with very clear expectations of, of what that's going to involve. They've brought spices, they've brought emotions, and they're going to do their thing. Very kind, very beautiful, but nevertheless, these are expectations. This for them however sad, is about closure. This is about, you know, goodbyes and farewells and all that stuff. The Jesus they're looking for is dead. The Jesus they're looking for is gone. The Jesus they're looking for is a body. 
That's what they saw, that's what they understood, and that's what they expect. So the angel says, you are looking for, by which he means expectations, preconceived ideas, but you will not find what you are looking for. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Boom. Um, then, uh, this is so interesting, verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The final word, actually, in the earliest copies of Mark's Gospel, is the word afraid, um, which, which I love, because it seems the resurrection did not immediately transform, um, you know, fallible people into faithful disciples. And the reason for that is because resurrection has implications. All right. When we talk about fixing what's broken, when we talk about repairing what's damaged, when we talk about a new, fresh life, there's implications to that. To stop what's not working and to go into a new life that might work has implications. And those implications are, are frightening for these women. So you see, these were Jews, right? And to accept the idea that resurrection had occurred was to accept the twofold notion that, number one, a new era had come, where, where men and women would live new, unbroken lives, fresh, alive, healed, restored. Implication number two, that all who had hoped for and fought for that new era, but who died before it came, would be raised from the dead. And by the way, that's what that weird reference at the end of Ma at the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew refers to. Remember that weird reference at the end of his Easter story? He says, at that moment, the moment when Jesus died, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died came to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. What Matthew meant when he wrote that was that the new era in which men and women would live new unbroken lives had come. The resurrection was actually here. Now all you had to do was embrace it and live it and enjoy it. Now, here's the drama. When we in our, in our life look for Jesus every now and again, we're just like the woman in this story. We, we, we look for him to, to meet our expectations. We expect Jesus to match the, the, the preoccupations of perhaps our religious baggage. We expect Jesus definitely to make our lives better. We expect Jesus to be like any other consumer product. We expect him to work. We expect him to, 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 to deliver what we want him to deliver. And, and I think the continual pressure in church is to pretend that those things are true, to pretend that Jesus, that Jesus actually works and that he works in a very specific way. He works to, to make us happier and healthier and wealthier and all that jazz. And, and, and that's just not true. It's, it's a lie, actually. It's a well-intentioned lie, a lie that comes from a good heart, but it's still a lie. Listen, <clears throat> Christianity isn't true because it works. Because it doesn't work. Not in the way you want it to. And that's why you can be a Christian and still be sad, depressed, scared, broke and hurt. You can be a legit Christian 
and have the most dysfunctional of lives. You can be a legit Christian and cry yourself to sleep every night. You can be a legit Christian and be racked with terrible anxiety. It just happens. And the pressure today is to say that Christianity is true because it fixes those things. And it doesn't. Christianity isn't true because it works. Christianity is true because it's true. And here's the truth of it. It doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter how messed up you are. It doesn't matter how scared you are. Jesus came to be our righteousness in life and our punishment in death. And so what is true is the very thing that seems so untrue. And here it is. You ready? Here's the truth. You you are right with God. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus are yours. So trust that and keep trusting it until the last and final day of resurrection. A day spoken of in the last, I think the last page of the Bible. You know that day where where, where, where John says in the Revelation, finally, he will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So there you go. Happy Easter to you and to your family. Uh, look, yeah, so... Um, uh, uh, I know that today was meant to be my my last day, but you know what? Uh, uh, the board and Carissa spoke to me this week and and said, you know what? That's a little bit too soon for us. We need some time to uh, figure things out and see what we're going to do next. So um, uh, they asked me to hang around a little bit longer. And I said, yeah, absolutely. No problem whatsoever. I'd love to do that. So I'm going to be here a little bit longer, probably at least to the end of the month, maybe even a little bit more than that. And uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, and uh, I look forward to, to, to being with you again uh, next Sunday. God bless. Thank you for being with us today. And I know the message that Darren and I sent out to the church family last week was was a little sad and sudden, um, but we are glad to say that LifePoint will still continue with him preaching over the next uh, few weeks. And as I've been saying to many of you, I'll be in touch with you over the next week or two. If you are not on the Life News list, please email or call me and uh, I'll be bring you up to speed. God is good. And Father, I just pray for each person watching our service today that your love will pour over them. And Father, as we are reminded of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ today, it may it be a reminder of what is yet to come. And Lord, because of you, we can live life abundantly. And because of you, we can have hope. And because of you, we can have peace. And because of you, we can face whatever tomorrow brings. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.